And let's go to chapter seven, or how not to be arrested for my online business. So what are we going to look at today? Well, we're going to start with a quick review and then dive into chapter seven, uh, looking at law and ethics. So first, let's start with the review. Uh, well, so what have we talked about so far? Um, hopefully you remember all this, but we started with the Internet Foundation, um, looking at all the different technologies and the history of the Internet, and we'll figuring out what exactly it is we're talking about. Um, and then we got into talking about revenue sources and web presence, uh, you know, how to collect money uh, or make money, how do we present ourselves, and then look at some advanced technologies like social media, mobile, and auctions. Um, and all of these are being used for marketing and business to business. So what we're going to be looking at today is kind of the big picture, what's going on in the environment around all this stuff. Okay, so the legal and ethical environment. Um, and that's really kind of the goal of this uh, chapter. So chapter seven, looking at how the law impacts e-commerce. Okay, and keep in mind, we're going to be focusing on this from a very U.S. Uh, based perspective, obviously, because we're in the U.S. And we do talk a little bit about international trade, but there's just so many laws in so many different countries that we simply cannot cover at all. So we're going to cover just the basics and most primary uh, concepts applicable to here in the U.S. And we're going to do that by looking at what are the basic principles of government. And how do those applications, or how can we apply those basic principles to e-commerce issues? And so we're going to look at a variety of different e-commerce issues. So the two basic principles. Well, we're going to start with number one. Um, and it begins with the discussion of why are the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the Constitution uh, such incredible documents? Okay, um, and, and you living here, you may not even have this type of perspective, um, but they really were extraordinary. If you look at the history of governments um, and politics, these two documents are absolutely extraordinarily different than anything that's been seen prior. Um, now, since then, there's been a number of countries who have copied us, um, but we were the first. Now, so the, I don't know if you got this all from history class. Uh, you, you, I'm sure, had some good history of you know how our founding and the American Revolution, um, and how we rebelled against the uh, English. Um, but what was so incredibly awesome about these two documents is because it was the first time in history that our na uh, a nation, any nation, was explicitly created on the basis of individual rights. The first time ever. Um, and so what are the implications of that? Why, why is that so unique? Well, because it, this is the foundation of who and what we are as a government um, and as a people. And this is what led to such significant growth and prosperity in this nation. It's because we wanted to protect individual rights. Um, and, in, and it's based on that foundation as who and what we are today. The second basic principle is going to look at um, why do we have different entities in our country uh, or in, in, our, in our government called like the country, the state, the county, the city. Okay? Um, and these all developed out of a means, and this is built into the Constitution as well, um, as a means to uh, federalize our country. So you probably heard that we we're a federal um, uh, a federal political system, basically meaning that we have, uh, you know, it, there's a, there is a um, country level government that's also, uh, you know, we elect officials who then go into that government, but we also have state governments um, who have independent, not 100% independent, but a good deal of their uh, legal system is independent from the U.S. Uh, country. Um, but what this allows us to do, though, is at the very top level to have a few simple principles for governing. And then as we break it down into smaller units, we can have more specific types of laws applicable to that area. So what's the legal implications of this? Well, our, every government, and this is true not just here in the U.S., but all over, is based upon a system of jurisdiction. And by jurisdiction, what you mean is what is the area, what, is, what encompasses uh, the, uh, 
who has control over what laws in what area. And so state laws of North Carolina are only good in North Carolina. State laws of uh, New York are only good in New York. If you're living in North Carolina, you don't have to abide by New York laws unless you go to New York. Then you have to abide by their laws. Okay, so jurisdiction and individual rights are the two basic principles that are really going to be relevant to what we're talking about today. Now, there's a lot of other um, legal principles that are very, very important. Um, we're not going to get into them because it doesn't matter to what we're talking about, e-commerce. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this thing, individual rights. And unfortunately, uh, we really haven't kept up with protecting it like we should. Um, but you, you, know, you can see in two different places where we talk about these rights, okay? So the Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence says, you know, the, uh, that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Um, and we also see in the Constitution that they mention uh, the rights to life, liberty, and property with, um, in the 14th Amendment that these rights were well known and established many, many years ago, that these are the principles by which we want to live, okay? Individuals have rights, and the most fundamental right of those is life. But in order to stay alive, you need to have liberty. And in order to, uh, and if you have liberty, you're acting, you're doing, you're free to create but you're also then free to keep that property that you've created. And that's where the, you know, you have a right to property comes from. And then you, as well, you, you, not only do you have the right to your life to act to the products of that action, but also you have freedom to be motivated by however, whatever makes you most happy. Um, and these are the fundamental rights that really guided our founding fathers when they created this country, okay? Why are these rights? What is not allowed? Well, you're not allowed to force other people to do things. And you're not allowed to commit fraud. You can't trick people into doing things. You can't take a gun or a, bit or a club and force people to do what you want. That's not what they mean by rights. What they mean is um, as long as you don't try to infringe upon somebody else's life, liberty, or property, you can do what you want with your life, your liberty, and your property, and your pursuit of happiness. And so that's the foundation of this. Um, and I can probably go on and talk about this in great deal of length of what does that actually mean to have individual rights. Um, personally, I think you're going to get a little bit uh, you know, bored if I dig in too much. Um, so I'm not going to, because I don't want you guys bored. But this is one of the principles, and, and if you haven't really dug into what does it mean to have individual rights, I highly encourage you to find some good books um, or do some research and find out more about it, uh, because I think this concept, which was, again, this was the one and only thing, this one major principle that really separated the United States from every other country in the world prior. Um, and, and this is coming from, you, know, you have to realize, of all the countries in Europe at the time, in the 1700s, England was known as probably the freest country there was. And guess what? America said that's not good enough. We don't want just some of our individual rights protected. We want all of our individual rights protected. We want, you know, if I have property, it's mine. Not only can not other people have it, but nor can the government. Okay, and that's another important principle of individual rights is it doesn't just apply to your neighbors, it also applies to government. In other words, the, the government should not be allowed to take your life, to take your liberty, or to take your property um, and l without due process, basically. So unless there's, uh, unless you forfeit it. So if I kill somebody, yes, I've, I've forfeited my right to life or my right to my liberty so I can be thrown in jail because I killed somebody or, or executed, whatever. Um, and that, that's the, the foundation of it. All right, moving on. Enough said. Um, and so then between individual rights and jurisdiction, those are the two main things here for all the legal issues in e-commerce. So let's take a quick rundown of what those different issues are. First off, in the jurisdiction realm, 
we're going to talk about sales tax. Um, I think we're going to quickly see the end of this being a significant issue. Um, there are some signs that within the next 10 years, it, it, it's going to be a much smaller issue than what it is today. And then there's also international trade. Um, and there's only a limited amount of things I'm going to say about that just because it, it can be a very comprehensive t uh, topic. Um, you can have an entire uh, class just on international trade. Um, and the e-commerce issues would obviously fill in with that as well. All right, we're going to talk about different types of contracts. Um, so we're going to look at the end user licensing agreement. Um, EDI contracts, you know, we're talking about EDI in the B2B commerce chapter. And then we're going to look at terms of service and what does that mean for uh, users. And lastly, we're going to talk about different tort uh, issues, um, in particular intellectual property rights and how they apply to copyright, patent, trademark, and defamation. So let's get going and talk about sales tax. Um, so sales tax, who can collect sales tax. Do any of you guys know? Can our federal government collect sales tax? Can the states? Can the cities? Can the counties? Well, what we find is that actually our federal government cannot collect sales tax. If they wanted to do that, they would have to uh, create a special um, amendment to the Constitution to allow them to do that, uh, just like they had to do uh, for income tax. So before the United States uh, federal government could collect income tax, they had to pass an amendment to the Constitution that allowed them to do that. The same thing uh, would apply with sales tax. Now, not all states collect sales tax. There are a few that do not have a sales tax. Um, what does this mean, collecting sales tax, and what does it mean for e-commerce? Well, a lot of e-commerce is done uh, long distance. So merchandise sold by e-commerce sites, are they subject to sales tax? The quick answer is yes, but not necessarily to be collected by the business doing the selling. Okay, so let me break this down for you. What this is basically saying is, if I'm in North Carolina and I buy a product online from a company in Washington State, that company in Washington State does not have to collect sales tax for North Carolina because their business is located in Washington State. I'm located in North Carolina. Now, what's supposed to happen and most states have these laws that have sales tax, is that once that product is delivered to me in North Carolina, I am supposed to write a check to the North Carolina state government for that sale. How many people actually do that? And how many states actually go after the people in the state for not paying sales tax? Okay, the number is almost zero. Now, if I had gotten my car and drove to Washington and purchase something directly from that company in Washington, then I do have to pay sales tax right there in Washington because I'm physically located. Me as a customer and the business are both located in the same location. If I'm doing uh, um, commerce across state lines, so interstate commerce, and this is where the interstate commerce law of the Constitution comes into effect, basically saying that states cannot regulate interstate commerce. Basically what it's saying is, they can't charge taxes across state lines. And so I'm not allowed to. Now, then why is this a big deal? Well, because Amazon.com has gotten a lot of flack from people because you don't have to pay sales tax on Amazon.com. Well, that's not entirely true. Amazon doesn't have to collect the taxes because they're based in Washington, and yet they have a few offices in other states, but most states are not located in, so they are, by law, not required to collect sales tax in those states. Is that clear? No, it's not, because it's, it's, this is kind of an important issue um, when it comes to doing uh, e-commerce online. Okay. Amazon is not required to collect sales tax from purchases in states they are not low, physically located. They could voluntarily do that, and some e-commerce sites do do that. They voluntarily collect sales tax for various different states. 
but they don't have to. Okay. So what have some states done? Well, the states don't want to have to go off, off after all the individuals in the state because that's going to be almost impossible to regulate. So very, most states have been trying to find ways to go after Amazon um, to get them to pay tax, to get around this jurisdiction issue. Um, and one of the things they've done is going after Amazon affiliates. So remember back to affiliates, we talked a little bit about that in our marketing discussion and our revenue um, discussion. Um, an affiliate would be, let's say I have a website and I, I do a book review and then I create a link that takes my uh, viewers, my users, they click on that link, it takes them to the Amazon website. I get a commission from Amazon for each person that comes from that link. Okay, so I'm making money through Amazon. So what some states have done, or attempted to do, is to to um, say if you're an, if, if Amazon has any affiliates in a state, Amazon has to pay the sales tax to that state. Well, of course, Amazon said, "The hell with that! We're canceling all of our affiliates in that state." So Amazon's been trying to fight this because for them, uh, this is this does give them an advantage when trying to sell in many different states that have a lot of high sales tax because they don't have to collect that money. And it's, just a, it's a burden on them as well, having to collect all this extra money and then send that money to the state. Um, it's a lot of extra work when by jurisdiction um, issues says they shouldn't have to do this. Um, and so there's been a lot of conflict over this, and a lot of local businesses are saying, well, Amazon, Amazon, people don't have to pay sales tax on Amazon. Well, the people do technically, but they don't uh, in reality. Um, and so the, the, the confusion on this issue has is, is really grown, and so people are now calling for um, some sort of federal sales tax to overcome this. Um, to do that would create an entire new constitutional amendment. Uh, and then there's always the question of, well, what will they do with this sales tax? How big is it going to get? Yada, yada, yada. You can get all kinds of big discussions there. So at any rate, that's the big issue with the sales tax issues. Um, now, if you're creating a website um, and you're selling products directly from there, do you have to collect sales tax? You definitely do if the person is coming physically located in your state. In other states, you don't have to. But more and more online businesses are simply to avoid any issues in the future. All right, international law. And this is where things get crazy. <clears throat> I'm trying to understand what's going on. Because every single nation, and not just every single nation, sometimes every nation then has individual states, counties, and cities, just like they do here. But every single nation has their own laws as how you can sell within their boundaries. And even though you may have a website, there still might be laws regulating how uh, e-commerce is conducted when you're not physically located in their nation. Okay, and it affects even small businesses. Um, so you can't necessarily escape from these laws. Now there's so many out there, it's almost impossible to know all the different laws. And what a lot of businesses do, especially small businesses, is they ignore them. Because here's, here's what can happen. Suppose you are doing business over there, and they have a law that says you have to do something. But guess what? They can't enforce it with our country. So this because their law says they're supposed to do something uh, doesn't mean they can enforce that law on you because you don't live in their nation. Again, this comes back to jurisdiction. So even though they might have stuff trying to prevent their citizens from doing stuff, it doesn't always impact you. But sometimes it does. And some common issues include trade laws. So there's specific things that can be sold or not cannot be sold. Sometimes there are tariffs on things that are being sold, physical products that have to, that are being shipped across uh, uh, nation boundaries. And then sometimes there's even a thing called a value-added tax, which basically says that if you want to sell a product in a country, there's so much of that um, you have to, there's a t essentially, you can just call it a sales tax, but there's so much that has to be value created or added um, in the country that you're selling to, or else you have to pay this tax. Um, and, and, and it gets very complex. Um, I'm by no means a, a law expert in this area. 
but a little bit semblance of knowledge will go a long ways in international trade. Okay, and with an e-commerce site, that's very easy to do. Uh, but try to avoid some of the major issues. Um, if you have any questions, talk to a lawyer, um, particularly someone who does specialize in international trade. All right, let's move on and talk about contracts. So let's look at the first one, the end user license agreement. Now, every piece of software you buy, you're not actually buying the software. And you're probably wondering, what the hell? I thought I just went out and spent all this money on the software. I bought it, right? And what you bought was a license to use software. Okay, um, you're not actually buying the physical thing, and I know that's sometimes a hard concept for people to wrap their heads around. But what you you buy a license to a, to use it under a certain conditions. So, like if I go out and buy Microsoft Office, some of the conditions under which I have purchased this software, one of the reasons why it's so cheap, is because it says on their license agreement that I may only put it on one or two computers. Now, I can't remember the latest. They've changed it over the years. It used to be that if you bought one copy, you could put it on two different computers. Uh, I don't know if that's still true today. Uh, so don't quote me on that. But their license agreement, and it'll say how many process processors can this be put on. It'll say, you know, on what type of conditions you can use the software for. So they might even specifically say you cannot use the software for anything illegal. And that's just to help cover their butt uh, in case somebody tries to sue them for your usage and doing something illegal. All right. So that's the general end user license agreement, how you can use a piece of software. Now, there's also a variation of the uh, license agreement, the, the GNU General Public License, oftentimes um, called the GPL. This is the type of license given out for open source and free software. And generally, this type of license agreement is not about usage so much as it is about distribution. Um, so if it's free, obviously once you have it, you can use it however you want. They don't care. What they do put conditions on is how you can distribute to somebody else. So you can then take this free piece of software, make some modifications. If you do make modifications, there are certain conditions under which you can then redistribute. Like can you charge if you've made some changes or not? Okay, um, and so the GPL gets into all those different issues. So if you're ever using free software, whether you download it on the internet or you're using it to build your own web server, because for things like Linux, um, uh, which is the operating system, Apache web server, which we'll talk more about later in, in the semester, you could be using a database like MySQL, um, uh, which is also another uh, open source uh, software for databases. And, uh, and so you can, use a variety of these different things to create your website or distribute things from your website, but do understand if you're using the GPL that there are conditions on how you distribute it. All right, there's also contracts in EDI, electronic data interchange, which we talked about. Um, those can be very large and complex. I'm not gonna get into the issues of those, but do understand that they are there and, and exist. Um, and lastly, I wanna talk about ter terms of service. Um, which is basically, you know, if you're using, let's say, software as a service, um, uh, or fa Facebook, right? How many of you are on Facebook? All right. Um, chances are most of you. Now, do you know that Facebook has a terms of service? I don't know if they call it that explicitly, but they do have, uh, Facebook does have uh, a list of requirements, expectations that you must abide by if you're going to use their service. Okay, they're providing you with a service, providing you with the, their software. They're giving you access to their software to write messages to your friends and have them be able to write you back and to be able to share pictures. But you're using their service, so there's terms onto which you can use that service. And if you don't abide by those terms, Facebook can boot you off because it's theirs. It's their hardware. It's their software. They've put them millions, probably even billions of dollars into developing these. If you want to use it, you have to abide by their rules. That's what a terms of service is. 
basically saying, these are our rules. If you want to use this, do it under these conditions. Okay. All right. And then keep in mind there are things called implied contracts, such as when you click on an add to shopping cart button, um, which basically says that uh, the implication or the, uh, what's implied there is that, you know, I'm interested in buying this. It doesn't necessarily commit you to buying, but it also, from the um, seller's point of view, commits them to actually having one of those in stock to send to you or the capabilities of sending that to you, even if it's not in stock. Something that they can get a, a hold of and sell to you at a very short notice. So that's what an applied contract is. It's, it's nothing that's necessarily been completed, but the idea is uh, we're starting to develop the fin finished contract. Um, and and we're, when we agree to the terms um, by doing that. Okay. Um, now, it's not a huge, huge issue of implied contracts, and I believe in the legal system there is some uh, basis for those, um, and I, I can't talk about that because I'm not a lawyer, don't know all the details, but it is um, uh, relevant to how we develop e-commerce sites, and that especially if you do add this capability of, you know, being able to add things to a shopping cart, you do have certain expectations that you must abide by as a business creating this shopping cart. Okay. All right. And now the last area, copyright. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is all part of intellectual uh, property rights. The first one we're going to talk about is copyright. Um, copyright protection. Uh, it used to be, prior to 1989, that if you wanted anything you wrote uh, to be copyright protected, you had to apply uh, to the federal government. They had a, a, an office for doing that. that. Specifically, that was their job, is to copyright things. Uh, it started becoming too burdensome. Too many uh, people were starting to write, and they couldn't keep up with it also. And with the explosion of computing systems, they said, this is impossible. There's so much new content that they basically uh, they pass a new law that says everything that's written is by default copyrighted. That means if I write a blog post or I go online, create a web page with any type of content on it, it is assumed to be copyrighted. Now, there's a minimal copyright protection, and then there's still the full-fledged. You can still go apply to the office, get an official copyright, um, which is a little bit more comprehensive and protects your rights better. I, again, I don't know the, all the significant differences, but what's important to you to realize is that, well, for number one, fair use, before I get into uh, the important details. Um, so in copyright, there is a fair use exemption, basically, which is for... When can you use somebody else's writing um, without their explicit permission? <clears throat> and here's the issues of the times. And this is this, I found this quote. Uh, For purposes such as criticism, comment, news, reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. So how? What are those conditions? What does that mean? Number one, it cannot be commercial in nature. So if you're selling something, you can't use somebody else's writing of it without their permission. That would be a violation of their copyright. Um, you also have the, the nature of the copyrighted material. So there's certain types of material, um, you know, let's say like you're using someone's image or photo. Um, there you can't just take part of it, you're always taking the whole thing that's more likely to get you into some issues. Uh, which also, the second one, the amount and substantiality of a portion used. So for example, if I quote a paragraph out of a book that's 100 pages long, one paragraph is not a violation of a copyright. If I quote a paragraph out of a page that has two paragraphs, well, that's almost half the stuff. That's considered a substantial portion that could be an infringement of copyright, um, even if you put quotes around it. So just putting quotes around something doesn't necessarily take, uh, you know, free you of the infringement of copyright statutes. Um, and then the fact of use upon the potential market. So let's say I did do this, but I have a private website. Um, so 
only 10 people have access to it, does that really affect the potential use of the market? Not really. And so, again, this can, can get a bit complex. But in general terms, this is what I've taken away from it. If you're selling something, don't use anything copyrighted without their explicit permission. Okay? Yes, if, and, and I did this once with a, um, a website I was developing for um, a school. And one of the... Uh, uh, one of the parents of that school was a photographer and taken a bunch of pictures at the school and of the kids. And I thought, oh, these would be great photos to put on the website. But what I did first was I contacted her and said, may I use some of your images on our website? She sent back, yes. And she sent me a file of some of those images. Now, she didn't send me all the images she took that day, and that's fine. But I had a nice collection of images I could potentially use. I got explicit permission from her to use them on their website. Okay, that's what you need to do. Um, if it's information or non for profit, please still be careful of using copyrighted material. Um, now, you could say if it's being used for teaching, scholarship, or research. Like if I'm doing it in class for you guys, I have a lot more freedom for what I can do. Because again, it doesn't really affect the potential of the marketplace if I'm the unit you know, only with 30 students. Um, so if it's information or not for profit, um, yes, you're still liable for copyright infringement. Um, do use it very sparingly. Usually the general rule of thumb is just get permission. Um, but consider the rules for citation to avoid plagiarism. Um, same thing like if you're writing a paper for a class. You know, the same, same issues. Make sure you cite where you get information from. Um, you can write critical uh, pieces for the web. That's fine. You can do quotations. Just make sure you're very careful about not using copyright material. I don't want any of you getting yourself in trouble. Now, what can't you do? Um, you cannot use any image that's published on the web. And there's some temptation to do this because it's so blooming easy um, to see an image on some website and say, oh, that'll look great on my website. You right click on it, you do save it picture as, you save it to your computer, and then you upload it to your website, um, you, uh, in, uh, set it up on your website, that same image. Um, Guess what? Can't do that. All right. Luckily, there's a lot of websites that have free downloads available. Um, so do a Google search or a Bing search on, um, you know, free images for websites or just free images or free graphics. And there's websites that are dedicated just to giving you free stuff. Now that is great. You can use that. Those have already put into the public domain. Those you can use. So do. And you won't violate any copyrights that by doing that. All right, the next major issue um, within intellectual property rights that affects e-commerce is the trademark laws. All right, so a trademark is a distinctive mark, model, device, or implement that a company affixes to its goods it produces. This is important. Domain names are considered protected by trademark. So, for example, if you have a business, let's so say it's called Nike, you, by the, that trademark, now can control Nike.com. Now, you still have to pay a domain name register company to get it. However, if somebody else tries to, um, tries to get Nike.com, tries to register that, and you come along and say, hey, Nike.com, that's our trademark. You can't have it. You can get it. Okay. Um, and it, it, there's a whole uh, legal tradition in the last you know, really 15 years that it it's revolves around something called cyber squatting. Um, and it's not as big today as it was back in the 90s when there's a lot of early adopters who went out and started registering all these domain names for all these big companies, hoping upon hope that when these big companies finally got into and made their own web page, they're going to want to buy these domain names from the companies that already captured all the, uh, all the, all the good ones. The big companies were basically started being extorted for large sums of money. 
you know, someone would run out, you know, some, some web developer would run out, register Nike.com, and then send a message to Nike saying, if you want this domain name, pay me a million dollars. And of course, Nike didn't really like that all that much. So they got their lawyers together and said, um, how is this protected? It's protected under trademark law. Um, and so they went to court and it was determined that, yes, in fact, that is a trademark violation. It is a, a distinctive model or mark or implement of the company. And so it was protected. And then there's, uh, you can also get into uh, the name stealing, um, which is a, another variation of the trademark law problem. Um, and I, I think I told you about Cafe de Manel. If not, I'll give you a quick rundown of it again. Um, it was a company I, I did a web development for. Unfortunately, the cafe has recently folded um, because of the uh, death of one of the founders. Um, but the cafe had a website under cafedemino.com. Um, but when they had a falling out with their previous web hosting company, the previous web hoster sold that domain name to somebody else. Cafe Demonel was out of luck. Okay. Even though they had it, you know, they could have Cafe Demonel trademarked, they didn't have the domain name safely in their possession to use. And it can also get into second level domain name disputes. Right, so not just the top level or the first level, but second level. So something like google.ecu.edu. If ECU decided to do something like this, to make a sub-level domain called google.ecu.edu, ECU could get into trouble because it, it implies a relationship with Google that isn't there. And so by naming it google.ecu.edu, um, you actually start infringing upon Google's trademark. And so you cannot do that. Okay. Um, all right. So that's all we're going to talk about in trademark, um, the big things, the domain names. Now we're moving on to uh, defamation and deception. So defamation is essentially either you know, libel, uh, libel or slander. Um, well, online, I guess that will always be libel. Um, Basically, saying something untrue in a negative context or in a negative way. So, basically, trying to destroy someone's reputation by saying false things. That's liable. Well, liable is putting it in print or uh, publishing it through uh, voice or um, video. Uh, slander is the same thing, but just saying it. Um, so, you know, if you're sitting on a street corner, um, you can slander somebody by saying untrue things about them uh, to make them look bad. Uh, and deception. Um, so, uh, you know, pretending to be something that you're not. Uh, basically, all I had to say about these two were don't do it. Um, you know, as web developers, you can get yourself into some trouble for that. Uh, just don't do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, if you want to say, if you don't, if there's someone out there who you, you, you're not real happy with, um, there's better ways of dealing with it than to sit there and libel them um, and get yourself into a little bit of legal trouble. All right. So we're, that was about all we're going to cover on the legal aspects. Um, although I'll, I'll touch a little bit when I get into the ethics, um, but that, those are them all the major issues. Looking at, at ethics now, this is a crazy, crazy area. Um, you probably had some classes in business ethics or maybe even in the philosophy department. Um, essentially, ethics is a study of right and wrong. Um, some people might even say it's the study of a, a whole system of uh, morality. Uh, an important point to consider here is what is ethical is not always legal, and what is legal is not always ethical. Um, and I think just a few pointed examples can really make that clear. Uh, although some people like to make ethical issues legal issues, um, they're not always. So you might have a certain belief system about what people should do um, in the confines of their own home. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't make laws to do that. All right? Um, so what is ethical? You, know, you may think being dishonest is unethical. But is it illegal to be dishonest? 
most times, no. Um, I can lie to people. Doesn't mean uh, I, I even it doesn't like necessarily count as deception or defamation. Um, so it's not necessarily there's no legal issues necessarily involved with it. There can be, but there's not necessarily. Um, and what is legal is not always ethical. Well, you know, just just you know, run over to uh, Germany seventy years ago. Um, you know, they had a legal system, and there were things that were legal or uh, uh, illegal that most people did not believe were very ethical, um, including their treatment of the Jews. Um, I think that more than anything is very explicit what what can be go wrong there. All right, so when we're talking about ethics, though, it does open up a whole lot of issues, in part because people do have quite a bit different ethical belief systems. Um, you know, and if I asked everyone in our class, what are your ethical beliefs? I'm probably going to find out that everyone has a slightly different variation of what they believe should be ethical or not. Now, there might be some very major trends that I'll see. Um, but here's an important thing that I, I, I like to make sure it's very clear. Just because everyone believes it doesn't mean everyone is correct. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not a proponent of ethical relativism, which basically says it's just rel relative to your background, whatever, you know. Um, whatever you believe is fine. I'm not the type of person who's going to support that. Um, it, doesn't, it does mean that any discussion of ethics is often very difficult. And there's one reason why I'm not, you'll see my approach is going to be different than probably what you've seen before. Um, uh, because discussions can be very difficult, and I don't want to get bogged down in that difficulties. But it does mean that dealing with unethical people must address multiple different perspectives. Um, what does that mean? Well, in online environments, you're going to interact with millions, maybe even hundreds of millions, perhaps even billions of different types of people. Um, they're going to have a lot of different belief systems, okay? a lot of different ethical systems that they're going to be bringing. As you're working online, you have to try to keep that in mind. And so some things that you do on your website, yes, you know they're to be the right things, uh, and you should always do the right things, but you still have to address dealing with these unethical people in such a way that they can't destroy, you know, they don't interrupt or stop progress in your own business. Um, but it's still respectful enough that uh, you don't, you know, you don't hurt your own business. You don't hurt where you're trying to go, what you're trying to do um, by having inappropriate dealings with people. And the last point I really want to make about ethics is that people often compartmentalize, there, ooh, big word, uh, compartmentalize ethical beliefs. Uh, and this really shows up online, uh, particularly when people believe they are anonymous. Okay? And there has been a fair amount of research to show this is true, that people act significantly different when they think nobody knows who they are versus when people do know. Because when they suddenly, when they think nobody knows who they are, they're like, well, I can say whatever the hell I want. I can do whatever the hell I want. I don't have to worry about any, any gosh darn thing. Um, so I'm going to you know, be the biggest jerk out there, or I'm going to you know, make all the stupidest arguments out there, or I'm going to try to rile everybody up and get them um, steaming about something that's not really true. Yes, that, that does happen quite often. And you also find people, though, who are well-meaning, but they still believe that they act one set of way at work, a different set of ways at church, and a different set of ways with their friends, and yet maybe a different set of ways when they're on Facebook, and a different set. Of, and so they compartmentalize what, how they should act, what's the right and wrong way to act in different conditions. Um, again, this goes back to the previous point. It just makes discussions of ethics so much more difficult. Um, all right, so that being said, what can we do? Well, I'm going to focus not so much on the different ethical systems out there, uh, because if you go read an ethics book or take a business ethics class, most times what they do is they focus on 
or they'll give you, you know, let's say, five different ethical systems. And say so they'll talk about you know utilitarianism, or they'll talk about um, the categorical categorical imperative, or they'll talk about altruism, or they'll talk about the um, you know uh, various different principles um, or guidelines or um, you know the golden rule, and then they'll tell you go pick one. Well, that doesn't really help you a whole lot figuring out which one's right for you um, or really make sense of all that's going on there. So rather than doing that, and I, of course, I have my own ethical system, uh, belief system, and I, I'm 100% confident that it's absolutely correct. But my job is not to preach that to you. What I want to give you is some tools to help think through for yourself what is the best ethical system, okay? Okay. Um, so, and here's, I think, a great place to start. So you might already have a set of beliefs that you already agree with. That's great, okay? But I always say, what is the foundation of the ethics? What is the foundation? Well, ask yourself, what, why should we be moral? Is it because God said so? Is it because my parents said so? Is it because my friends said so? Is it because, you know, that's the, just the rational thing to do? Is it because, you know, society expects me to do it or just because, okay? Um, or is it because there's something fundamental about humans that says we should have a moral system? And so I say, let's look at the facts and the logical implications. Let's look at, you know, let's be, try to be objective about this. Um, what is it about human nature that requires a moral system. Because I do believe it is a requirement of based upon who we are as humans. There's something distinct about us as humans. And if we can find that, figure out what that is, it makes sense why we would need morals in, even in the first place. Okay, so if you look at the facts of human nature, you can, by thinking through it, figure out what, is, what type of moral system might we need. The second question I would say is considering an ethical system, ask yourself, what would be the consequence, consequences of following the system 100% of the time? So don't compartmentalize and say, this is only what I'm going to do uh, at church, or this is only what I'm going to do at work, or this is only what I'm going to do with my friends. What can you do across the board all the time, everywhere, whatever you're doing? Okay. Um, and what are the consequences? So if I believe, let's say... Um, you know, utilitarianism, okay? So how practical is it to do that all the time? And if I did do, if I did act on that principle all the time, um, so the greatest good for the greatest number, well, how do I, how can I do that, you know? And, and ask yourself, what are the consequences if I do that? Is the, if the greatest good for the greatest number implies that I should kill myself, would you do it? I sure as hell wouldn't. So can you follow it all the time? And would there ever, ever be any times where that is not the consequence? Um, so that's, I think, are the two big things um, to look at when you're looking at uh, trying to figure out or trying to make sense of all these different ethical systems. What is it about humans that requires to be moral? And looking at the different systems out there, Ask yourself, what would be the consequences of following this system 100% of the time? Because by doing that, if you can do it 100% of the time, this is what you gain from that is a very clear and principled way, an objective way to act. And it makes life so much easier. Okay? It helps prevent contradictions. It helps prevent difficulties um, where things clash and you're not sure what to do. Should I... Should I take this class or should I go out and party? Should I, you know, date this person or listen to my mom who says I shouldn't, right? Those are the things that can help you solve. All right. Um, now, we're going to look at one particular area of ethics um, that is very, very pertinent to uh, e-commerce, and that is in privacy. Um, this is the only major issue we're going to talk about uh, today. And then we're going to be done. Um, so what is privacy or why is privacy of value? So privacy, that's how I look at it, is it, it's a desired state 
okay, a state of being. And I'm going to say, what, what, what does it mean to be private? It's a desired state uh, where only the information that I want to share with specific people uh, is observable by those people. So I choose the information I want to share. Now, we don't always think through all the implications of this, but it's a value because what does it allow you to do? What, what does having privacy allow? Okay. So I, I've thought of a few examples that I, at least in my personal life, why I value privacy. One would be, let's say I'm working on a book. I'm not going to share people the contents of the book because I don't know what they're going to do with that. They, if it's not copyrighted yet, it's still private, right? Um, once I publish it publicly, then, it's, then it can be copyrighted. Um, but someone could take some of that content and use it or resell it. Um, they can publish it first, and then they have the copyright of my material. And that would, that would really suck for me. Uh, they might steal a patent I'm working on. And if they can get to the patent office before I do, guess what? They get the patent. Okay. Um, so it behooves me to keep some of that you know, intellectual property private. Um, there's also times where you know, I'm enjoying a movie. Um, I want to do it in my own house. I'd rather actually prefer watching movies in my own home than going to the movie theater, in part because I get this layer of, of um, I can enjoy things without having to worry about other people looking at me or thinking about what I'm doing. Same thing kind of with uh, intimacy. You know, uh, Most people prefer to be intimate with their significant others behind closed doors because they value that special time with that person. They don't want people looking at them judging them, saying anything, interrupting. Um, and so there's a, it's many different ways. And then you can look at personal information. Why might I want to keep uh, my address private? Well, because I don't want people showing at my doorstep or sending me for things um, that I may not want. Um, because it's an interruption of my day. Uh, and yes, I can tell them to get lost. Yes, I can call the police and have them removed. But it, it, it takes time away from my life that I could be doing other things. Okay. So there's a lot of different reasons why things can be of value. But then the question is, why do we share personal information? If privacy is so important and so awesome, why don't we just keep everything private? Well, because we aren't hermits. Uh, we don't just live by ourselves, at least most of us aren't. Uh, we like interaction with other people. But when we interact with people, we have to share personal information for them to be able to figure out how to interact with us. And so I liken this to, you know, um, I uh, dating. Okay, and so this is a good place to start to start thinking about privacy. You know, if I start, you know, when you start dating somebody, you start maybe on the first date, or maybe even before the first date, you share a few pieces of information just to see if you two connect at all. Um, on the first date, you start sharing more and more information. Uh, you don't dish out everything usually on the first date. Um, usually, you just do it in bite-sized chunks, things that you think might help them to understand you better, and uh, vice versa. So you're trying to develop a trusting relationship. Okay? Um, so a lot of times we share this personal information in order to develop these relationships with people. This is true even when you're doing business with other people. Okay? Um, now, it's, it can be very minimal. So for example, if I want to buy a product, I either have to physically go to a store to buy it, or if I'm doing it from a distance through a catalog or through um, uh, online, I still have to share some information. So if I'm doing it at a distance, they have to know my address in order to ship things to me. If I go face to face to them, they're going to be able to see me, see how tall I am, see you know the color of my hair, my eye color. Um, all this personal information is there and they can observe it. And I'm willing to share that information with them. Uh, sometimes, and especially as you develop much more deeper business relationships, uh, much more intricate or complex relationships, more information needs to be shared. You know, can I trust this other company? Are they competent to do what they say they're going to do? You know, they say they're going to build uh, this, uh, you know, building for me. Well, have they built anything ever before? What, you know, uh, 
What types of problems did they run into? How did they resolve them? Um, if you're going to start interviewing with people, you know, you go for a job, what does it do in the interviewing process? You share your information. Not only your background, your, your, uh, you know, your work background, but your education background. And then also, you know, as you're talking with them, they try to develop, will you be a good fit with the organization? So does your personality, the personality of the organization, of the culture of the organization. Um, and you have to, this is all part of this trading relationship. Okay. So yes, privacy is a value, but also sharing information is important and is a value uh, in certain contexts. And so you want to choose to share some information for a lot of these cases. Um, and so generally speaking, and I kind of threw this pie chart together and sort of randomly picked vectors, but there's things that you're always willing to share. You just don't care. Okay. And some, for some people, this is a really small slice, and some people it's fairly big. Um, you know, some people might say, well, I don't care if people know the color of my hair. It really doesn't matter to me one way or the other, or my height. I don't really care if they know my height. And then there's usually a segment of things that are sometimes shared, and depending on the depth of the relationship, you're like, yeah, most people, I don't care. Um, yeah, but I still want to choose those people. And then there's even this slice for things that are rarely shared. Um, and often this is a fairly big slice of things that, you know, you have in your home that you only have a few friends and family that know about. Um, and that's really all you want. Um, and then there's always those things that you never want to share that are, are yours and personal. Not even your most significant other even knows. And things that go on in your own mind or your own personal journal. Um, that those are yours and always want to remain yours. And so every person, though, divvies this pie chart up in different ways. Um, and sometimes they have multiple sub-slices, you know, the things that are sometimes shared. Maybe there's some of it that's shared in certain contexts and not in other ones. Um, so, for example, like my address. My address I'll share with many businesses, especially if they're shipping things to me. But I'm not going to share my address like with my students. I like you guys and all, but I'm not telling you my address. Okay. Um, not that you couldn't probably find it if you were clever enough out on your own, because so many businesses do know my address. You might be able to find it some way that way. But the point being, oftentimes it depends on context, right? Um, what information is shared in what ways? Okay. And so that's the basis. And when you're talking about privacy, so when we get into issues in privacy law, and privacy is a big, big issue today, in part because so much information is put on the web. Um, and especially people go on Facebook. Oh, my God. I'm sure all of you guys have seen this. People just put things up there. You're like, why the hell did you put that on Facebook? Are you serious? Um, but uh, there are some issues that are very applicable that we need to talk about. So one, number one, do we have a right to privacy? Now, in the United States and in some other countries, this legal tradition has developed over the last you know, 100 years or so. Um, and essentially what it's saying is that you do have a fundamental right to privacy um, equal to life, liberty, and property. Okay. Now, I am not one of those that agrees with that foundation. Okay. The, it is a growing legal tradition, and so there are laws... Um, around and surrounding that, um, that uh, you have a right to privacy. The, what I, my biggest issue with it is it tends to be very non-objective. It tends to be very, you know, looking back at this pie chart, for example, um, it changes by every single person. What is being shared? Okay. So how are we going to have one right to privacy that describes that modified shapes that's going to change by everybody. Um, what can be private by whom? What's well, going to be different by every single person? So how can you have one right to privacy? Um, now, should privacy be protected in some way? Well, I believe it can be through property protection. We already have property rights. Okay. So for example, if I don't want people to know something about what I'm doing, uh, I can do it in my house. Right? Close the doors. Nobody can see what I'm doing. Close all the window blinds and, and drapes. Uh, close all the doors. Nobody can see in. And I can do whatever I want in the confines of my home as long as, you know, people won't know. Right? Um, the same could be said of, you know, if I wanted to write um, or if I want, um, you know, so all those examples I already gave you, well, they can be done in your own home 
and people aren't allowed to walk in your door because guess what? It's called trespass, and there's property rights to protect that. Um, so the whole right to privacy thing, I think, is uh, uh, can has already found a foundation that it can be protected through. Um, I don't believe it needs an additional legal requirement. Um, now, I would recommend you go out and read up on it yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Um, and in fact, if you disagree with me, I would love to hear a great argument for a right to privacy. Um, and I'm always always up for a challenge, so feel free, bring it to class. So let's, let's, let's hammer it out and figure out what we can learn. All right, um, so what does this mean in online terms, specifically as you're collecting content as a business? Um, now, there are two basic approaches to privacy law. One is the opt-in, which says, essentially, as a business, uh, can only collect information, compile information about somebody if they explicitly consent to it. So as a user, you have to opt in for them to collect information. Okay. Throughout Europe, this is generally the law. It's an opt-in policy. An opt-out policy basically says businesses can compile all the information they want about you unless you specifically tell them not to. Okay, so it's basically saying the negative of an opt-in, or I don't know if the negative is quite the right term, but um, I won't call it the opposite, but the negative variation of it. Um, businesses can compile data about you unless you specifically request them not to be compiled. Um, and that is by, in the US, the default law. So they can collect information all they want about you until you tell them to stop. They can then, once it's collected, they own it. They can share it if they want to, or even sell it, okay? Because it is their property once they have collected that data. And you might say, well, how can they have property of my information? Well, it's information about you, but information um, is just, once it's on a computer, what is it? It's nothing but a bunch of electrons. So they own those electrons. Those electrons are in a specific orientation, and they can share that orientation with somebody else if they want to. You can change your own personal information. I can change my hair color and go dye it. You know that so they, they, that changes it, right? Uh, height is a little harder one to change, um, but I know some people do shrink as they get older, and maybe that'll happen to me. I don't know, um, but you know I can move. I can uh, change you know my credit card number. Um, I can change information about me, okay? And so what they might have compiled about me could be wrong, but they can share it because they have that orientation of electrons on their property and they can share that with whoever they want. And if they want to charge people for that, they can, okay? Um, so that, that's kind of the different approach to privacy laws um, throughout the world. Um, yes, we do have a limited right to privacy um, it's specifically geared more towards how the government can collect information about you than about how businesses collect information about you. Most of the right to privacy law is geared towards that, basically saying the government is limited on how they can collect information. Businesses are not, unless you opt out. Now, that being said, it's a, when I say the opt out is a default policy um, or legal tradition, Many businesses will use an opt-in policy because it makes people happier. And they want happy customers. Because happy customers means more profits. All right. That's all I'm going to say about privacy. So summarize. Um, United States. What was so freaking un uh, unique about us was that we were the first absolutely first government in history established to protect individual rights. Um, and that, although it's been shared in, uh, uh, throughout the world, and so not a lot, of, a, a lot of other countries now do, maybe not 100%, but still have adopted a much stronger policy protection uh, of rights than they ever did before. Um, the other principle we talked about was jurisdiction. 
um, as another principle of, of, of um, the legal system. And between the two of them, we look at how those uh, impact taxes, contract, and intellectual property rights. Um, so make sure you at least understand the basics of each of those uh, consequences. Uh, in the ethical system, we really didn't dig too deeply into it, uh, more looking at the basis. Uh, it is important to e-commerce because of the best variety of individuals we interact with, some of which are not so nice, but we can't necessarily do something about it because of the laws don't allow us to. Um, but we have to know how to interact. Okay. Um, one important issue, privacy in particular, um, is something that's still trying to be hammered out in our legal system. Uh, people are still doing a lot of thinking about it. The best approach that I can recommend, though, is we should protect privacy by understanding and uh, abiding by property rights. And if you do that, you can select what information you share with whom um, and decide what is observable and what's not. And if you don't want people to know about something, keep it to yourself. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't go emailing it to your friends. Uh, don't share it. And that is the best way to keep something private. All right. That's all I got to say for today, guys. Um, we'll catch you next time in Chapter 8.